All right, we good? Can we start? So um, another question would be how how we could actually fix this. Um, is there a way to do this thing a uh, functional way? And um, and yes, there is. And I would like to show like we, we're gonna slowly go towards the, the, the right implementation. And, and I try to do two things with this example. So one will be introducing a state monad, what that is, and try to understand the concept behind it, but also show how, um, how using some FP uh, techniques we can actually have a uh, more stable uh, um, code that we can reason about um, uh, without fear, basically. So now the question would be, both, both we learned that both service and, uh, and cache are, man um, uh, are manipulating cache service are manipulating some some cache information some map or whatever now we want to stay uh, as much fp as much pure as we can so now the question would be how i can how can manipulate something if my function was supposed to create like only like because because the whole idea behind functional programming is that my function will always for a given argument will always give me the same value right because that, that, that's basically the whole idea behind functional programming. Maybe this is something I should cover at the beginning uh, when I think about it. It's too late. It's too late. Huh. Okay, so why functional programming? Uh, functional programming embrace modularity. I know everybody would like to have modular code, like, you know, divide and conquer, right? That's why microservices are so popular right now. Because everybody thinks now, oh, I have this crappy complex solution. If I divide it into smaller things, which I can actually understand, like this thing and that thing, I can reason about this in, in, in like its own scope, and I can reason about this in its own scope. But, but people forget that at some point all the services will go up into the network, and the complexity does not disappear. It's still here. Right now it's on the network. That's the only difference. Instead of you know, having your problems <coughs> within the CPU and RAM, now you have problems with network failures and all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that functional programming magically makes the complexity disappear. If your problem is complex, your solution will be complex, right? Now, however, we still want to divide and conquer. We just, we just want to know, we just want to maintain the complexity. If we could provide modules like pure module. What I understand is purity in modules. I understand that if I have a module here, if I test it, it works, right? And I have other modules it tested, it works, and I put them together somewhere out there, it, the solution will also work. So what about actor model, outline, for example? You have your little actor here. You can test it, you can see if it works. It has its internal state, right? You put a mes message, it'll give you a message back, but internally changing some state. But you test it, it works. You have, your, you have your actor here with some other state, with some other messages. All works, you have your tests, everything is green. You put them together into production and it works. Few, few actors communicate together. Each of them can, let's say, like, let's say you have right now three actors communicate together. Each can have 100, 100 states. So number of possible states is 100 multiplied by 100 multiplied by 100. And now you get an exception, an error, right? You try to run it, everything works just fine. Because one of, out of those 1 million or 10,000, uh, uh, sorry, 100,000 possible states, only five will actually raise that error. And I'll try to reason about that. Well, I, when I talk about modularity, I would rather have a module where, wait, no, if it's tested, it works. And, and I'm just saying, functional programming will not make the, the complexity disappear. The only difference is they have like 30 or 40 years of research, and those guys already had all those problems, and they've researched it, and they had an idea how to deal with this complexity. It's there, you just have to learn it, which is pretty neat. And functional programming, and functional programming will deal with pure functions, meaning if I have a function f, for a given argument, let's say 10, it will always give me the same value, let's say hello, right? Whatever happens, if it's raining, if it's sunny, if I'm in Poland, if I'm in the US, this thing will always behave the same way. And now if I have a function g here that takes a string and returns a double, and I can test it, I know this works, then I can reason about something more complex. Because I can take this function, this function, compose them together, 
and I have something more complex with, uh, of which we can reason about, but I know this still works because there's no global state that could change the way those functions are working. They will always work this way. So now if we have a problem like this, what can we really do about it? The cache will be changing, right? If you look for a user, your hits and misses will change. You need to actually insert the user into cache. You maybe need to retrieve the user from the cache or maybe delete him, delete him from the cache. And if my functions are supposed to be pure, what I can really do about it? Well, one of the ways to do it would be this file. So I'm changing my approach a little bit. So I still have a user, I still have cache, but now cache is just a data structure. Nothing else, doesn't, oh, sorry, doesn't have any additional functionality. Internally, it holds, it holds immutable data structure map, which will hold a user for, for a given integer, for a given ID. It will hold number of hits and misses. And now, I can provide two functions. I don't need object or service or class for my functionality to work. I'm closing this object over this object cache only for the reason to have some kind of namespace, but that's basically it. What I have right now is I have a function. So I have a structure. It's not an object. Object is when you have a structure and behavior, right? State internally. Here we have some just, just some data structure. I'm just saying cache just has a map, hits, and misses, and that's it. And now I provide two functions, insert and get. So let's look at get for a minute. As I said, we, we want to retrieve user from cache, but we also, when we're retrieving user, we are manipulating the cache, right? We will change the number of hits and or misses. So if we want to stay pure, if we want to have our functions to be pure, the only signature that we can have, if we think about it, is the one that will take some initial cache will give us a value, in this, exam in this example, option of user, <coughs> but it will also give us the modified cache. And I'm not changing, I'm not modifying the structure internally, because what I'm doing is, uh, I'm create so I'm taking the map from the cache, from the one that I get as a, here, as the argument. I take the, um, I, I just assign this to a variable m, then I create, and I create a new cache, and I'm saying, if that map contains the given ID, then I will create, this is this copy method in Scala, creates new instance uh, out of the existing one. So it will create a new instance of cache out of the existing one, out of the C, but with hits being you know, incremented by one. If, if the, uh, that was not the case, if I couldn't find uh, a user for a given ID, I will create a new cache instance with misses incremented. And at the very end, I, I return whatever, whatever uh, actually user needed, so they, ne they needed an option of a user, but I also uh, return, I also return uh, modified cache. The same thing goes for, for insert. I mean, insert also inserts cache, a user into cache. So I could, well, I could just have a function that goes from cache to cache, right? It, it takes some cache and insert the user into it. The reason for that, um, I'm, I'm returning a unit, Mine seems weird, you will see in a moment why, why that is. I just made it for, to, to make some things more visible in a minute. So now, the repository this time will have a different signature. So right now, repository, ah, uh, damn it. Repository, you remember repository was previously just for given integer, was giving us uh, either an, uh, an error or a user. Now it's, give, it's taking a cache and it's giving us a modified cache and also what we want, the, the, the disjunction between an error message and a user. So right now, what's the difference between previous solution? Right now from type signature, we know repository is modifying cache, right? At least we hope so, at least like for some reason they take cache as parameter. They still could just not use it, right? But, uh, but we get this hint that, that most probably they are modifying cache. If they were not taking cache, they were just, just returning a string and a user, then we would know uh, cache is not modified because that's the, on, the only way to modify cache you need to actually take it as an argument. Just one disclaimer here, in like a normal situation the repository function since, since it would be calling some JDBC method it would also like close all this stuff into task but I'm not bringing task right now into this example because that would make things all a little bit more complicated 
a lot complicated. So let's just say for a minute that we, we ignore the fact that actually, you know, retrieving data from database actually requires, you know, I.O. type like task, which, which makes uh, effective computation, right? Let's, let's just ignore that for a minute. Is that okay? Because just to make this example a, a little bit simpler. So now I know the repository is changing the head. <coughs> so now I, my, my final solution, find by ID, also will have to go with the same signature. So from cache, it will give me a modify cache and a string and a user. And I'm just calling, I'm just calling that function get. It will, it will give me a new cache and, and maybe user, right? And depending if I had a user, well, if I had a user, I will repair, return a not modified cache because I'm not doing anything to it and that user that you need from the cache. Or if you actually, uh, the user was not available, then I will call repository with that, with that ID and that modified cache, right? We need to provide not the original cache, not this one, but the one that was already modified by calling method cache. Let me just quickly maybe put it that everything is sort of hopefully, hopefully visible. So I'm calling cache, it will give me a modified, uh, uh, get, calling get method, it will give me modified cache, modified, you know, the, the state is modified, and also the maybe user, right? So now if maybe user exists, I'm all good. I have to, the type signature is telling me, you know, return a couple, a cache and uh, the value. In this example, the user, the right-hand side of the disjunction. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just give, give them the cache, the NC1. However, if the user was not available, then I have to find him in the repository. But the repository, um, you know, it takes an ID to give us a function that takes a cache. So I have to provide the cache to it. And this, this functionality, this, the, the way that this is implemented, will work. But has one major flaw, uh, which we will try to solve at this point. And do you have any idea what that flaw might be? And the hint would be, I can make this code compile and not work correctly. The, I'm just focused on this, only this part, not anything else. Just this, this bit here, over here, those two lines. Each of those functions, insert, get, uh, and find in repository, they, ca they take original cache and give you a new one. So if you call them in sequence, and I'm calling them in sequence, right? I'm first calling get, and then sometimes, depending of, you know, of the, whether I find the user or not, I'm calling find as well. So I have to provide whatever the new cache is, I have to provide it as an argument to method find, right? But what happens if I just do this? Will it compile? Will it work correctly? No. And this is a simple example, right? Because we ha only have two functions which are called one after the other and they have to pass a, a, a state between each other. What would happen if I have like five of them? And they are closed all over different like the monads. One would be within task, other with an option. Craziness. So we would like to solve that. And we will solve this with something which is called state monad. Now, um, before, whenever we had a problem, what I would normally do, I would just go to Scala's sources, right? And look for the right type class. Now, there's a problem, because if you go to Scala's, which I will do, and you will try to look for, you will try to look for what a state is. So you will eventually learn that state, uh, type state, uh, state, is this thing here, is a type alias for state TIDSA. Okay, this looks weird, right? But let's see what state I t is. Well, we will go to state t and we will learn that state t is an index state t of f s s a. Right, so we will actually try to go to that index state and we will basically see this. And this is just wah! Um, so instead of looking at closet sources, uh, and they did this for a reason which I understand, but it's out of the scope of this presentation. If you actually are interested why they did it the way they did it, there's a presentation from Lambda Colin last year when there's uh, actually the contributor from Scalaset who actually made this change explaining why he did it. And it's actually a very nice presentation. But instead of doing this, let's do something different. Let's try to implement implement uh, 
sorry, Scala mode. There it is. Let's try to implement state. Oh, you might not see it. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry. Hello. Okay. Let's try to implement state from the scratch, like the very basic version of state monad. So what? Um, so if if we actually look at our type signatures of the classes that we've been dealing with. Uh, for the past few minutes, they basically take initial state, whatever that state is, in our example that's cache, right? And they will return a modified version of that state and maybe some value that we try to calculate, right? So all our functions, all our functions, they pretty much looked like, wait, this is it? Yes. They pretty much looked like there, there were functions like val the, the, their signature was from S to tuple SA. Oh, is it? Um, okay, like that? So they're pretty much the signature was something like this, right? From S to SA. That, that's basically the, the function. So we had some function uh, F with that signature. And the problem that we had was that we had to pass that changing state around whenever we were calling those functions uh, in some kind of uh, sequence. So now let's write, okay, you don't see this, so uh, I know what I will do. Object example, all right? And now, okay, and now there we go. So now we will try to, so, so we, will, we are dealing with, with something of, of functions with, with, that, with that kind of signature. So let's try to reason what actually state parameterized by SNA is. It's a class. It's just a normal class in Scala. And it's a wrapper. It wraps over something, it wraps over one single value. It wraps over function. That's it. That's all it is. It, it, so, so if I have, so just to give you an example, if I have val, let's say I have a function that goes from some function, right? That goes from an hour cache to modify cache and and int, right? Something like that. I could, I could, and you know, some implementation here. I could create just an object state, which would look like this state cache uh, int and I would really like to just um, wrap over this so I can just call this constructor right I can just I can just say I can just say func it will compile that, that's all it's doing there's no magic behind it okay the, you might have a question while we are doing this and I I just ask for your patience that there is a reason for it but right right now just to try to try to stay with me that the only thing that actually uh, okay, so uh, it's just a type, uh, so I have to have to do like you know, new state uh, cache int like that. So this just it just wraps over that function, and then that's all it's doing really. Okay, so far so good. Shouldn't be really that hard, right? I know it's still we wonder why we're doing it, but just that uh, just stay with me. Okay, so now let's, let's actually try to make this thing a monad. So normally when you, when you create like an, as you guys remember, monad is, um, monad is a, 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 a bind and applicative, right? So we need to have a point and, and bind a flat map. But in order to, f to have a full comprehension, and that's only what I'm focusing on right now in Scala language, you just need to have fu function flat map and map. And this is what we will try to implement. But you can, if, if I had flat map, which is bind, and at and a point, I could always create map out of it as well. So that's about it. This is also a little bit exercise for you guys to see something, which is, I think, really, really cool. So um, a map function would be something like this. I have a, 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 what I have is, uh, um, so let's call it, let's call this maybe, can I call it run? No, let's call it f. Okay. So uh, a map will take, uh, a, take a function, like uh, let's, let's call it h for a minute, that goes from a to b. Right? This is, a, this is basically what map was, was doing, right? And we want to get in return state of SB. 
right? If we if we at some point where we would like to have a functor instance for state, we could just reuse that map function implementation, right? Does anybody has an idea how we could implement map? The cool the cool thing about functional programming, which I really enjoy, is in majority of cases the only thing that you need to do is just follow types. Nothing else. Um, so I will, I will quickly create, I, I want to have like, so just, just in order to have something like nice, I can create object and just have a method def apply here uh, that, will, that will take that, that will take, take something like this and it will give me a state um, as a, which will be just basically calling new state as a with that f. And for reason for that, it's like actually I can I can then say just state without the apply. It's just the synthetic sugar. Now, as I said, we only need to follow types. That's all we need to do. So let's 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 think that we let's reason about for a second. I don't know what map is. I have absolutely no idea what map is doing. Can I still implement it, um, implementing by following types? Let's see. So I need to return state s of b. Okay, so let's just, let just say, and it needs to be here parameterized, obviously. Like this thing, okay, so uh, s and a, okay. So I will just say, I will just say state, right? Calling the apply method, as you guys remember, you don't have to really call apply method it, uh, underneath uh, Scala compiler will look for it. And, uh, sorry, I do apologize. <coughs> so, so I will be having, uh, what I want to have is this, right? This is basically what I want, right? Mm -hmm. This is what I need. This is, this is what maps actually need for me to return. I'm just giving it to him. Okay, but this constructor actually takes something internally um, Wraps. It wraps over a function, as you guys remember, right? What kind of function? It's a function that takes some s of, of that s and should return us what? What does, what this function should return? Let me just, I would like, maybe do something like this so you guys see it, everything. What this function should return? Right? It, it should return a tuple, right? It should, like there, just a reminder, state is just wrapping a function. It's doing nothing else. It wraps as a function from S to S something. In this example, we want to return state as B. So the function that we want to wrap is a function that will go from S to S B. We need to return a tuple, a new state and B value, right? Does this make sense so far? We wrap over a function, and that function will go from S to SB. So the thing that we need to return needs to be a tuple SB. Okay, so we need those two things. We need, we need S and we need B, right? If we have this, we have running example. Like we have a, a, a um, compiling and working map function. Where I can get B from? Like let's say this, this B here, right? Val B. Where I can get B from? Exactly. If I have to call H with argument A, where I can get A from? If I, if I call F, F goes with S. Do I have S? It's already over here, right? But no, F is actually returning me not A, it's returning me S, A, right? And remember what I miss here? And that's all. Map implemented. And there's only one way to actually do it. No need for stack overflow. Just follow types and they give you the implementation. And the good example for this is this, if this example for following types is complex, uh, remember how we had this first introduction to Scala and we had some exercises which we skipped? One of the exercise is to implement compose or I think and then method. So try to do that. Try to, you have two functions. One goes from A to B, other goes from B to C, and we, and we want to have function that will go from A to C, which is basically compose or and then, right? 
and try to implement this. And if you will follow types, you, the, the implementation will emerge for you, like basically for free. Because there's one way to do it. Flat map will be pretty much the same. So we could so flat map that we actually need. The difference only between flat map is it that it takes an A, but it will give us a state of S and B. That's the only the difference within the signature, right? And we need to have uh, as a return type state S of B. So now, so now let's try to let's try to implement this. Well, if we actually look at it, it's already here, right? We need state S B. We need we need this, right? But H is returning that. Can I just call H? Can I? I can, right? So if I call H, I will have my result. But H takes an A as an argument. So, so val A, I need right now A. Where I can get A from? One more time, I can call an F, right? So I will call F with, with, with S, which will give me, which will now give me, um, uh, sorry, uh, S. 1 and a, but wait a minute. I previously had s because I started with, with wrapping over s, uh, state sb. Now I just called h here and I don't have that s. Well, you know, I could say, I could say uh, state, state sb, so then I, will, then I will actually get this function, so I will actually get this s as sorry s so now i have a function here something like that right but now i have i no longer have um, state of s and b i have state of s of state and b so because you know this is expecting right now a tuple it, it's expecting s1 this thing here at this point we are one more time expecting an S, new S, and a value of type B, right? But we have here, we don't have, we don't, we don't have it. We have only state of SB. So what can we do about it? Remember this is state SB, right? Just a reminder here. Can we just call F on it? Can I call, what happens if I just take temp, call F with, um, with S1? What will I get? exactly what I need. A B value and S, and this is what we have to return, a tuple. Okay, it's, if, if that's too hard, um, I'm just saying, okay, I, just, I encourage you guys to do that as a, because this is, this is not necessary to, uh, to understand what state monad is, because you guys already know, state monad just wraps over a function from S to SI, and we will see in a moment why that is, why do we actually need it. But uh, the, in order to make this exercise, the idea behind this was exercise was to show you that uh, you can implement some, some sometimes complex stuff by just following types. If the types match, most probably this is the only implementation that you will, yeah, that you will need and it's, and it's the correct one. But we're not going to use our implementation. We will use implementation from, from Scala Z. I will just try to like Im and explain what state is, re-implementing it. Re -implementing it. So just remember, state, state wraps over your function from S to SI. That's all it's doing. And also gives you all this functionality from being, in fact, it's being a monad. And, and now we will actually see why that actually makes a, a, makes a difference in our, in, our, in our solution. So one more time, we have that user. One more time, we have that cache, right? Nothing changed here, but now our functions, they used to, let me show you what they used to do. Inset would take a cache and return a cache in a unit, right? S to SA. Get would take a cache and return a new cache and an option of user. And one more time, 
from S to SA. And the same thing goes from repository and the find user by ID as well. So they have all the same, the same signature. So in order to use state monad, we only have to take those existing functions and wrap them over state, right? We, we, we want to have them to those functions to return a state monad. So the only thing that we need to do is take everything we had before, this what we had before, but we are wrapping it over state. I'm still not explaining why we're doing this. We're going to see that within a minute. But I'm just saying that the only difference that we're doing towards this method is just closing our existing functionality over state. We do this for both insert, get. We do this for find, right? And finally, when we have those three methods, which were previously just taking cache and returning a new cache with a value, so both for get, insert, and find from the repository. Now we will go to the, our, our user service where we were trying to, to co like use them in sequence. Since state is a monad, we can actually use, you can actually use the for comprehension here. So I'm calling get method, which gives me a state of, uh, of um, S and uh, option of user. But what I get on the left hand side, the way that the monad is implemented, is only that option of user. And then, and then having that option and user, I'm mean, doing exactly the same as I think before. So if, if that user actually existed in cache, awesome. Then just, just make, um, make it one more time an either type, so we call write on it. But you, uh, we have to re remember we have to return a state, right? That's not, we, we have right now, okay, sorry. So this thing, this thing, user.write is just, is just this, you know, the disjunction user on the right hand side. But we were supposed to return, we were supposed to return the whole thing close within state. So we have a value and we need to close it over state. But state is a monad. And what do we get from monad since it's applicative? We get point. That's why we will call, we will call method point on it. And, and since state, state what as either type take two type arguments, we have to uh, partially apply the first one, so cache, and we leave the, the whole full, full value. So this happens if actually uh, user exists in, in cache. What if it doesn't? Well, we still need to return state cache of string of user, but that's, that's basically what the repository is returning us for us, right? That's what the repository is returning. So we will just call, at this point, repository.find. This solution is pretty similar to what we had before, but because we are using state mona, there are two significant differences. First difference is we are no longer passing state around. It's being passed for us. So this returns a state, this, this cache thing is just, just traversed with our, with our steps of our calculation. The other difference is, previous implementation, if you look at it, on the previous implementation, well, it's maybe not a big of a, of a difference, but it was, a, it was returning you, still, it was returning you a, a function that you were supposed to, at some point, call with some cache, right? and it will give you what you really need. Here we have, here we have an object, we, we just get a state, so we get that function closed over, closed over that, that wrapper, but we can still call that function internally. There's a, there's a method called run, so I can, always, I can always do find by id 10 and call run on it with some arguments, like with, with empty cache. So it will trigger the calculation. The run method triggers the calculation. It just calls the function that is wrapped within the state monad. But now the difference here is that we, we don't have to pass the state around. Because we're using for comprehension, the cache is being passed between those calls for us, and we will no longer make that, that exception that we had before. The difference between the implementation user service find by ID and user service underscore tour is that uh, here, here the repository is being used explicitly. I'm just saying use repository. Uh, and here I've, uh, I said, well, the fetch method from the repository 
will be provided as an argument. So we provide this lambda, we provide implementation, we provide uh, functionality to actually fetch user from a repository as a dependency. But we, don't, we are not using m traits and, and then we don't have to use actually mocking systems and all that. We just, provide, we just provide lambda expression. On production, you would instantiate user, user service and you have to provide that fetch method and it would just say repository that find and partially applying the find method and that, will, and that would compile, right? So does it so far make sense? Because I want to show you how the tests look like, uh, what's the difference between what we had in the OO solution compared to that we have here. You, you called a run? What yeah. Was, what was that? Run. Run. So, like... Is that on the state? Yeah, it's... Uh, okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, it's not here. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's... Um, um, type state. There we go. And... Okay, it has to be here. Wait a minute. It's it's definitely here. Oh, there it is. There it is. So it's run. So it it it, it will it, it will just take. Um, it's as I said. It's it's index state t. So it's a little bit more complicated than than state. But it run run will just run will take your function and 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 run it with the argument that you provide mm -hmm. here as the as the initial value. So That's so. Uh, <coughs> I think they have they have the same meaning. Uh, apply, yeah, right, yeah, like, yeah. They have. Like you see, they they call apply underneath. So it's like it's, it's basically overloaded. Um, okay, I see you guys are confused. <coughs> I get that. Um, maybe, 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 maybe test will test will help. So, so this is right now tests for that implementation with state monad. So I have my user and as you guys